Hello. Do you know what those buildings are? They're called the pyramids. Some people say they're the most famous monuments in the world. To see them, you have to come to a country called Egypt. And that's where I am now. Over the next few weeks, you're going to come exploring with me. You'll be finding out about one of the most fascinating countries in the world. Some parts of Egypt look quite like Britain, and the big cities are much the same as big cities anywhere in the world. There are skyscrapers and flyovers, motor cars and traffic jams. That's modern Egypt, and that's not really what I'm interested in. No, I've come to learn about the people who lived here thousands of years ago. The people who set up huge statues like this one. The people who built these mighty temples. The people who painted these beautiful wall paintings. and the people who covered their monuments in this strange picture writing. And while Louise is taking you around the sites, Raven and I will be telling you stories about ancient Egypt and singing you songs. And we'll also be showing you how to start your own classroom museum. Yes, with exhibits like this Egyptian mummy. There he is. And these Egyptian writing boxes. And also we'll be showing you how to make your own Egyptian jewellery. And how to put up Egyptian obelisks, like this one. Here's one of the things that we've been working on today. It's a table map of Egypt. And to make quite sure that it works, I've put these Egyptian good luck signs nearby. The sign of life and the eye of Horus. According to the Egyptians, they were both sure to bring you luck. You watch while we finish the map off. Egypt is a hot, dry country, and most of it is desert. So we've been covering all this area with glue and then sprinkling on sand for desert. Just like this. I think I've got enough sand left. That's yeah. it. Almost done. One desert. Good. This blue bit up here, that's the sea. And we've also left a strip down the middle blue as well. And that is the River Nile. And it runs right the length of the country. In fact, it's one of the things that Louise went out to see. And there it is, the River Nile. It's said to be the longest river in the world, and it's almost certainly the most famous. And from up here, you can see why it's so special. You can see how the river flows through the desert with a narrow strip of green fertile land on either side. The river allows the Egyptians to travel up and down the country, and that was particularly important in the old days. You see, the ancient Egyptians had no roads to speak of, and the Nile acted like a motorway, a motorway made of water. For transport, they used sailing boats, much like the ones you can still see today. And when the wind was against them, they would roll up the sails and then get the oars out and row. The Nile also gave them food. It has always had plenty of fish, as you can see from this carving and people have been fishing here with nets for thousands of years. Here's an ancient Egyptian fisherman. And here's a modern Egyptian fisherman. The Nile was useful to the Egyptians in many ways, but the most important thing that it did was to help things to grow. Nothing will grow in the desert. It's too hot and dry, and the soil's wrong. It's all sandy and rocky. But once a year, the Nile would flood and overflow its banks. When that happened, the river would cover the nearby land in mud. 
This would turn into rich black soil, ideal for growing things. And after that, all the Egyptians had to do was to irrigate it. When you irrigate soil, you water it and stop it from getting too dry. And the Egyptians used to irrigate the land by digging channels and ditches which would carry the water of the river further inland. They also used something called a shadoof. A shadoof is a sort of bucket on a pole which can pick up water from the channels and pour it over the soil. I'm irrigating the banks of our river and that'll help to give it a nice strip of greenery. I've been growing palm trees out of cress seeds. And if you want to help them grow properly, you really have to keep watering them. You see, this side here hasn't had any water for, for ages. And it's beginning to look like it, isn't it? They're all droopy and feeble. Now, if you want to grow palm trees on your map, it's really very simple. You just take a strip of thick cloth, like this, soak it in water so that it's all damp, and then sow your seeds. Just, just sprinkle them on like that. Whoops, a few too many there. And then in a few days, up they come. Tiny little palm trees. The ancient Egyptians used to sow seed on the banks of the Nile too. Only they, of course, used to sow corn seed rather than cress seeds. And when it had grown and ripened, they'd harvest it and turn it into bread. The Egyptians were great farmers, although they didn't have modern things like tractors to help them. Instead, they had to make do with a wooden plough pulled by a pair of oxen. Egyptians still farm like this. It's not very modern or quick, but on the fertile banks of the Nile, it produces good enough results. The soil here is rich, and it gets the right amount of sun and water. That means that even old-fashioned methods work well, and the harvest is nearly always a good one, just as it was 3,000 years ago. Ancient Egypt was a good place to live. There was plenty to eat and nobody starved. But some of the neighboring countries were not so lucky. There the soil was poor and stony, and it was difficult for the farmers to grow food. That was the case with some people called the Israelites. And one day they decided that they would be better off if they went to Egypt and worked for the Egyptians. Well, at first, the Egyptians welcomed them. They gave them work to do in the fields, and soon the Israelites were making a good living for themselves. And as they prospered and settled down, they began to have families, big families. And that's where the trouble started. When the king of Egypt saw how many children were being born to the Israelites, he began to get worried. Look at all those baby boys, he thought to himself. Every one of them will grow into a man, and all those men will bend together, then maybe join with our enemies and fight against us and beat us. The king, or the pharaoh as he was known, made up his mind to crush the people of Israel. He made them into slaves, and he gave them hard, hard work to do, toiling in the stone quarries and hauling cruel loads of bricks to build his palaces. But he couldn't crush them, no matter what he did to them. And still the numbers of Israelites kept on growing as more and more children were born to them. So Pharaoh gave an order, a terrible order, let all the baby girls of the Israelites be saved, but let all the baby boys be taken down to the river and drowned. They must never grow up into men, or they will fight against us and beat us. Now, it happened that there was a woman called Jacobed, and she bore a baby son, and his name was Moses. She and her family were in great despair, for they loved the child, and they wanted to keep him. But what could they do? Pharaoh had said that they must drown the baby, and his soldiers were already searching through the Israelite villages looking for baby boys. It would not be long before they found Moses and took him away. As they looked down at the tiny child, their eyes filled with tears. But then, Jacobed had an idea. 
I won't drown you, she said. I won't drown you, not for the Pharaoh or for anyone else. And drying her eyes, she and her daughter, Miriam, went down to the river bank to gather rushes. They brought the rushes back, and then she and her family wove them into the shape of a cradle. Early next morning, the two of them left the house and slipped off past the soldiers. Jacobet was carrying a bundle under her arms, but fortunately, none of the soldiers asked to see what she was carrying. When she reached the Nile, Jacobet found a sheltered spot among the bulrushes and laid the cradle down in the shallow water next to the bank. Sleep soundly, little Moses, said his mother. We have saved you from the soldiers, and now you are in God's hands. So saying, she returned to the house while Miriam hid nearby to watch over the cradle. Later that morning, the Pharaoh's daughter came down to the river to bathe. She wasn't like Pharaoh. She was gentle and kind and felt sorry for the Israelites who her father treated so harshly. And now she could hear a baby crying. The sound was coming from some bulrushes. And when she parted the rushes, she saw the cradle rocking gently in the water. Inside was Moses, crying because he had woken cold and hungry. Poor little baby, she said. You must be one of those Israelite children hidden to save your life. And now you need someone to nurse and feed you. At that, Miriam came running up and knelt before her. I know someone who can nurse a child, she said. Shall I bring her to you, your majesty? Yes, said Pharaoh's daughter, and bring her quickly, for the child is hungry. So Miriam fetched her mother, and Pharaoh's daughter gave her the baby. Maybe she guessed the truth when she saw Jacobet's face, but she didn't mind. Look after the child, she said. The soldiers will not harm him. You have my word for it. And when he is old enough to walk and talk, bring him to live with me in the palace. He shall grow up as an Egyptian prince. I expect you want to know what happened to Moses next. Well, that's what we'll be telling you in the next four programs. But meanwhile, we're going to end with a song, a cradle song for Moses. Ramesses the king had willed that every Hebrew boy be killed. He destroyed each baby boy, drowned them in the night. Goodbye.